Good morning, everyone. Hello. Hey, Justin. Hey. Seems like everybody's been slowed down by approximately two to five minutes by the requirement that they sign into a Zoom account. So. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Did they just add that? That's exactly what happened to me. Well, um, I turned it on because I didn't want, um, um, because it's a lot easier to keep spammers out of the waiting room if you have to actually have an account. Um, and that was the implicit requirement we were using before with Google Meet, which frankly I was pretty happy with. So I swear I've been sitting here for the last four minutes like, oh, I guess, uh, um, I guess no one's coming today. And then everybody starts showing up within 30 seconds of each other. I'm like, oh, they were all slowed down by exactly this much by signing in. <laughs> there are lots of spammers on Zoom. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of spammers. Last time, uh, last time it was actually kind of difficult because with um, because you had to pick the spammers and the non-spammers out of the like waiting room list, mm -hmm. and you know people could just name themselves arbitrarily and all sorts of junk like that. So, anyways. Um, So as sort of a short summary, I'm gonna wait a few more minutes before anybody, uh, see if anybody else shows up before we dive into it. Um, but what what I've been working, well, what, uh, what we, the Peggy team have been working on over the last couple of weeks, or the last, yes, the last two weeks, is that we got the, uh, let's see, got two pull requests relating to uh, the bridge, uh, here we are. Attestation workflow um, relating to the to the Ethereum to uh, so this is this is the Ethereum to Cosmos Oracle code for the it, the part that's in the Cosmos module, and we've gotten that merged as well as some transaction batch stuff. So the Cosmos to Ethereum flow. So now uh, since then we've been working on tying it all together, uh, namely the namely the namely the orchestrator code. And uh, first and foremost, um, I had to stop and move uh, all of the, how should I put it? So we're writing the orchestrator in Rust and uh, we have a couple of libraries for doing HTTP interaction with Cosmos and transaction generation and signing. And I actually refactored both of those libraries to allow me to move all of the, all of the Peggy code into this repo so that you don't have to update an external library when you change something about the Cosmos module. So that was a couple of days worth of work. Um, but it's been very nice because it certainly allows for faster, faster, faster iteration. And then on top of that, uh, I've templated out the original, uh, the actual orchestrator module into a way that is runnable. And I'm getting into linking all of that up and dealing with a lot of the problems as you can sort of see from these comments, most of what we really need to figure out now is uh, sort of the all up integration of everything. And we'll have a working, uh, if not quite production ready version of Peggy. Um, my target is in two weeks or so. Um, so at the, at, um, um, at the end of next week, we'll be hosting uh, what we call Peggy Broken Net, which is going to be a four hour test net. So essentially we all get on a call uh, we start a testnet and we run through it and that will allow us to, um, and that will allow us to find some problems with the, uh, mainly with the way things run. I'm, I am worried about timing problems, ordering problems, connectivity problems, that sort of stuff. Um, and I think we can then get some nice proof of concept batch one way or the other. But you know, if it ends prematurely, it's not the end of the world. The goal is to sort of parallelize um, solving some very basic problems with the with the with the operator experience, um, along with getting a little bit of out 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 of testnet, uh, sorry, out of CI environment testing of you know very basic Oracle and batch workflows. Um, we're going to sort of see how that goes and then escalate from there to something resembling more of a real test net. Um, but yeah, that's, 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 that's roughly the plan and is what we are working towards right now. Um, I still need to go through these comments. Um, let's see. 
Is there anything else really worth covering? No, we haven't done any major design changes. Um, I think the only thing worth worth uh, worth worth talking about, in addition to just all this really dull refactoring and reorganization work, um, is uh, Jahan. Have you given much thought to the like uh, to the to the multiple ERC twenty support changes required for the contract? Or um, um, would you mind talking about that, or we can do it on a meeting later? I haven't given it much thought um, in the past in the past couple months, um, but uh, I don't think it should be too hard. Yeah, I think, I think that um, mm -hmm. as far as um, as far as I as far as my thinking had gone, and maybe there's there's some problems with this that I hadn't thought of, but I basically wanted to um, I basically wanted to uh, do do something where you would have. Um, and I may be, this might be wrong. I hadn't really thought of it that much, but um, it may be better to have separate ERC twenty contracts um, that are controlled by the uh, by the top level contract. Well, that's that's for ERC twenty out, but ERC twenty in. I think it's actually like there's some changes needed, but they're not like really, not really much. We're gonna. I think it'd be changing, adding some like uh, mappings. Um, instead of, you know, for the token contract, stuff like that, where you're just turning like, you know, one constant into a mapping, probably have to add something to um, allow people to use new tokens to add new, add new tokens, basically, because right now you deploy it with a token. So, um, yeah. Yeah. I so think multiple ERC-20 in is like going to be like pretty simple. Um, but then we mm -hmm. had talked a little while ago about multiple ERC-20 out. That's where you have ERC-20s representing Cosmos tokens instead of the other way around as it is now. And for that, um, that requires a little more thought because you would need a separate ERC-20 um, for each Cosmos token that was being represented. Um, Just that's a question how the interface here. works. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I'm Michael, I'm from McGorg. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Justin and Jehan, uh, I was just wondering if you had been tracking at all the NFT work for uh, Cosmos stuff. Mm -hmm. um, there's IBC protocols for NFT transfer and uh, that's just being in development right now, but it might be really useful as far as um, informing what decisions you make with Peggy too. Yeah, so I've kept, uh, so I wouldn't exactly describe it as keeping track, but I have, I have noticed several NFT features that are useful. For example, uh, extended uh, token name lengths. Um, so, you know, allow you to solve the problem of potential bridge, uh, you know, potential token uniqueness because they're too short in uh, the non-Stargate version of Cosmos. Um, on the other hand, we can't really do an IBC protocol compatible version. Well, actually, I should correct that statement. It doesn't really matter because the hard part is on Ethereum. We could do something that links into the IBC code, uh, but right now, uh, and I should consider that more, um, as far as like issuing, burning, and dealing with cross-trained tokens, we can probably use, uh, reuse most of that infrastructure, uh, provided it's not too specialized. The, uh, the challenging part is actually dealing with uh, uh, the the like actually challenging part is dealing with um, the Ethereum side of this. Well, no, it's all going to be challenging. I should correct myself again. It's going to be. Um, the, the, the like foundation of how you have to build everything around it um, is the uh, is Ethereum contract because it's the least flexible coding environment. So you have to give it, so you have to build that first and then you have to build everything else on top um, because you can't make concessions uh, to the Ethereum environment. You just got to deal with it. Whereas on the Cosmos side of things, you, you have a lot more freedom <laughs> and you really have to abuse that. Michael, were you thinking of making, were you referring to the, the idea of making Peggy work for NFTs or do you think that there's some NFT related features that could be useful for Peggy in general? I, I think it's kind of both in the sense that uh, um, the Cosmos transfer stuff is kind of nailing down how NFTs should, should look on Cosmos. And um, I think it will be relatively straightforward once you have the Ethereum stuff all working to to adapt to whatever they're they're planning for the rest of Cosmos. But uh, the, the the main question I'm asking is because I'm really looking forward to the day when Peggy Testnet supports IBC. That will make me very happy. 
Yeah. So Peggy plus IBC. Um, so far, the philosophy we've been going is that Peggy and IBC will be separate things running on the same chain, such that yes. we will sit down and make yeah. sure that a Peggy token can be transferred over IBC, but it will be like any other native token on the chain. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the handoff I have conceived of so far. But if we can manage to call into some of the same code to deal with the issuing and burning um, of Cosmos side assets, that would be nice. Um, but for now, it's we're really quite trivial in a sense. It's, it's quite trivial. So it's easy enough just to lift the existing implementation and use that even if they don't have a library for it. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I'll have to, I'll have to get in there and take a look at it. Um, right now, we're pretty much just fighting with interface points and endpoints and exactly how to get everything to talk to each other and get all the right information to the right components, which is 90% of the problem of any bridge since it's all about getting information from one chain to another. Yeah, I think it's also interesting to research, you know, how Peg could work with NFTs. Um, mm -hmm. I Probably very small changes are needed, but um, I, I imagine it may not work right now. It doesn't work yeah. Right now. Yeah. Well, we've been we've been sort of uh, sort of leery of digging too deep into Stargate before it was uh, air quotes ready, but it seems to be approaching that point pretty rapidly, which everyone's excited about, uh, and I'm sure that's where everybody is. This, uh, you know, I'm sure people are all off doing something Stargate related this morning, and that's why our attendance is a little down. Uh, but you know, I, it's a U.S. holiday too. So yeah. Uh, wait, holidays exist. I forgot yeah. about that. <laughs> um, oh, well, meeting's recorded. They can all watch it later. Those lucky people who still have holidays. Anyways, um, so as you can see on the Cosmos side, Jahan, things are actually already being written uh, with multi-ERC20 in mind. So I think that we just have to modify, and we definitely did talk about this before. We just have to modify Peggy.Soul with a mapping for the for with a mapping for the token contract and a mapping for the tx nonce mm, yeah i remember that now and yeah. um then we keep the checkpoint we keep the val set nonce because we have one validator set for all the tokens um and then we just have to go down to deposit uh here oh yeah i still need to rename this function call because i um or did I? So there's so there's submit batch. So here submit batch is going to need a need a token argument. Um, then so is so we'll update val set and submit batch, of course. And then where is yeah transfer out, which I still need to rename. I don't like that positive. name. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Um, I just don't like it. I have a personal opposition to it. Yes. Uh, well, okay. So you know the other thing is that sub. Um, the, that combination method, I, I don't remember where we ended up on whether or not that was a good idea, actually. I guess it, it, it was, I think what, yeah, what was, I remember there was, there was some discussion about that. Yeah, so the thing is that we could have update val set and submit batch. We can remove submit batch, um, but we got to keep update val set because we need to be able to update oh, yeah. the validator set without sending a transaction in the case of an idle bridge. Um, and I think that's ultimately the set, um, um, I think that's the set yeah. of commands we're going to end up with um, because looking at the cost of it, so um, for some rough numbers, just, just, uh, um, just to keep the math in mind, for a 100 transaction batch at like 100, 150 gui, uh, gui you're looking at on the order of half an ETH to send it, so like 200 bucks. Um, your, uh, uh, and it costs an extra five bucks to update, no, it costs an extra two and a half dollars because I was doing 300 GWA when I originally did these numbers. Um, it costs an extra two and a half dollars to update the validator set and, uh, and submit the batch. Whereas if you're gonna update the validator set independently, it'll cost you 20 bucks at that same gas price. So it, I mean, it doesn't make sense to let people send a batch of transactions without updating the validator set. Um, it's just so much more expensive. Um, so yeah, I think we're gonna end up dropping submit batch. Um, is that gonna play hell with the tests, John? Or can we easily remap the tests to update the val set and submit a batch? I, I gotta go, I actually gotta go through and um and do a little bit more work on the tests anyway. Mm -hmm. um, 
but no, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, I mean, it shouldn't be too hard. You might have to have to change some stuff, but yeah, there are tests yeah. for both of those. You just combine. I think I already did a, com I think I did a combined half path test already. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. This, Alex, hi. Um, I would like to add that we maybe keep the submit batch without the validator upset for a while. Just, I mean, first getting the MVP done and then we should also consider the discussion about optimistic or pessimistic behavior with some validator update. So when we submit a batch containing a validator update, we need to wait for the 50 blocks period to prevent forks. And while we have that, we don't really know, um, yeah, was this a successful or unsuccessful execution? And um, do we want to submit another batch in this situation, which is optimistic, or do we want to, yeah, lock, um, yeah, lock the, the bridge and wait until we have received um, either a confirmation or an error report? So this is a 50 blocks delay. And until we have a decision on what we want to do, I think it makes sense to also submit batches without a validator update just yeah to be on the safe side for now okay so that's a good point uh because if we submit a batch and a validator set update and we have a second batch uh we we may not necessarily know if it's going to pass because the validator set could have changed enough that the definition of correctly signed is now different um do we think it's going to over uh so Here's, here's just my immediate thought. Um, could, we, uh, could, could we have it set up such that the, uh, well, obviously we can, but should we? Should we have it set up such that the, um, such that the bridge is locked if the validator set update was a big enough change to prevent the new batch you're trying to relay from succeeding? But if it's a smaller change such that the batch still passes uh, the confirmed criteria, we just go ahead and submit it anyways and do not consider the bridge to be locked. Is this, sorry, is, I, I might be off on, on, on this. It's been, it's been a couple of months, but is this a gas saving measure that you're proposing here, Justin? I just no, want to be clear, or is it a security thing? This is less, this is more of a security thing. Um, because what happens is that, um, um, is that the Cosmos chain due to the 50 block anti-forking delay, uh, doesn't know whether or not the next batch that it is, uh, you know, like the next batch that it is producing should be signed by validator set A or validator set B because the previous batch updated validator set to validator set B, but it might've failed. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I can, can add, so there is nothing like a small change. So any change, even if it's uh, one plus one in power, will have a different checksum or check um, checkpoint, yeah. and this is stored. So it doesn't make a difference if it's I mean, if a oh, yeah, validator right. drops Indeed. out or okay. it's just plus one. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we can consider is submit batch with validator updates where the validators can be empty. Right. So most of the time, or most of the batches won't contain a validator update. So only when, when we have changes in the backend, then we would submit both together. But if it's mandatory in, in this function well, that we always have to submit the, uh, the current validator set, then we have to wait. Yeah, because we're always going to invalidate previous batches because they need to be remade because the validator set just changed however, um, you know, however little. Um, so I think so there were, I was, um, the, the check, what does the checkpoint have to do with it? Um, it's going to change the sign hash. That. Um, Alex, Alex had an excellent point, um, is that if you update the validator set, no matter how small your change, you're going to change the checkpoint hash. So mm -hmm. you can't, so even if the right amount of validators signed off, and there hasn't been a significant enough change, once you submit a val set update combined with a batch, you need to make all new batches. 
because none of them will pass the old checkpoint. So you're saying that if a batch gets signed by the validator set and then a new val set gets through on a contract where one validator had their power increased by one, that's the scenario you're talking about here? Yeah. Okay, so there's a completely insignificant change. Doesn't matter, it's way below a third. Um, that's gonna stop. So then you have a new batch that comes through and you, okay, so you have a new batch that you, you, you make this new batch, all the, you know, everyone signs. Um, yeah, I guess, okay. Yeah, I guess I see that, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, Alex, I think that we have to consider all of this behavior and part of the complexity is that we have to consider all of this behavior for all cases up from a almost completely idle bridge up to a bridge that is shooting out batches as fast as they can be made. Um, in a completely idle bridge, uh, obviously this isn't a problem because nobody's ever submitting a batch. Um, in a semi-idle bridge, there's only ever one batch out at a time and it doesn't really matter if we lock the bridge while we're waiting for the previous batch to be submitted. In a very active bridge, um, then yeah, I think we would want to be able to zero out the validator set update so that we can keep on, um, you know, putting out, um, um, you know, pushing out as many batches uh, as we would like, which brings up sort of the question. Um, actually, it brings up a couple of questions. Um, is there, uh, um, do we want to maintain a separate uh, submit batch and submit batch and val set update flow and just have it be that if the Cosmos chain decides it wants to attach a validator set update due to for some condition, um, then you just have to use the other endpoint and the relayers are just, you know, just have to have some code where they decide which one to submit it to. Because I think that's reasonable, but I also think it's up to um, what, what we think is easier to test, audit, and maintain. Um. I think in this discussion is important. It's for me, it's not the right time at the moment to do it. Um, mm -hmm. When I thought about it before, um, just in terms of the um, pessimistic approach, I think we could improve the contract by only submitting a diff. I mean, we submit the current validators, which are the, um, yeah, which are the, the checkpoint, or are hashed into a checkpoint. But if we also submit instead of the new validator set, a diff, which is mostly empty, I mean, can be an array of, of, of zeros and zero addresses, whatever, then the contract can be smart enough to do not update the validator set. I mean, it's empty, right? So, um, but I, this is just an idea. I mean, might not make sense. And I would suggest we open a ticket and um, assign a priority for, for now. I, I don't see that, that this is, anyhow critical. I mean, it's an optimization in the end. We should not forget yeah. that. And so, um, some of the, the problems of not submitting a validator set update um, can be solved by slashing. Yeah, so yeah. this is also an, an, op an option for us. Yeah, once again, good point. Uh, we should just, so for now, we're just gonna keep submit batch and submit batch and val set update. Uh, get things to sort of MVP and get a little bit more knowledge about the behavior and open a ticket for discussion of further options. Um, and I suppose eventually we'll be writing some sort of QA test to deal with idle, semi-active and really active bridges to make sure that these sort of three behavior classes work properly. Um, yeah, let's think. Uh, are there any other questions on anyone's mind? Uh, otherwise, I think we can roughly wrap up. Alex, I'm gonna try and get, uh, thank you for commenting on my pull request. I'm gonna try and get back to you uh, right after this actually. Okay. Cool, well, thanks for everybody's time today and um, See you in a couple of weeks, hopefully for a very early, very broken 
uh, public, I won't call it a test net, but public attempt to run some of this code. <laughs> uh, Looking forward to it. Thanks. For, nice to meet you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. More and.